Number 37, letter A. What force should the woman in figure 9.44 exert on the floor with each hand to do a push-up? All right, assume that she moves at a constant speed. All right, so here's our picture. And in order to do a push-up, right, we have to understand a little bit of the mechanics of a push-up. Your axis of rotation is essentially right here where your uh, toes articulate with the ground. And now we can think of this as now basically a rigid body, right? Or that's what we would say would be proper form to have your body as a rigid bar now, okay? So this now being the rigid bar, all right? And by the way, the rigid bar is not separated from the, you know, axis of rotation here. So I'm just going to draw it on that axis of rotation, all right? And now we have certain forces. I don't know why it keeps moving on me. But now we have certain forces that are acting on this rigid bar, right? Which is the woman's body. Uh, one would be the weight her center of gravity, and then the other would be this reaction force, all right, that she is pushing down on the ground with, and then that the ground is pushing back up on her with, all right? So if I were to now just draw this picture out on the uh, right-hand side over here, let me write letter A, and I will draw the woman's body. Here's the axis of rotation right here. There's her weight. Her weight is pointing down, and it has a value we can just calculate it right now. Her weight would be equal to her mass multiplied by uh, gravity. So 50 kilograms multiplied by 9.8. And the distance between the axis of rotation and that uh, force vector or her weight, as they told us in the picture, was 0 0.90 meters. Second is the reaction force now pointing up. This is where her arms are. And that particular distance, as they told us from the axis of rotation, is 1.5 meters. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to find basically this. I'll call it F sub R for reaction force. Now remember, we're asked to find the, the force of each hand, okay? But I'm going to remember that and not solve for each hand at the moment. I'm just gonna solve for the total force, all right, that she um, inputs basically to the ground and then therefore the ground inputs a force back on her, all right? And then we'll divide it by two. So. Uh, very simply, if we notice the nature of this problem, it's a torque problem, okay? Why? You got two forces acting at a distance from, a, from an axis of rotation. And therefore, that being the case, we know that the sum of the torques in the problem will equal zero. Again, two torques. We have the reaction torque, rotates counterclockwise, therefore it's positive. So torque of reaction minus then the torque due to the weight should equal zero. This uh, force would rotate it clockwise. That's why it's negative. And that'll all equal zero. So therefore the torque, <clears throat> so therefore the torque, the reaction torque, I should say, should equal the torque produced by the weight. All right, thinking about now how to solve this, let me just move this up so I don't run out of space. Make this a little neater. Okay. Now we'll have the uh, perpendicular lever arm. All these R's will represent perpendicular lever arms. The lever arm of the uh, reaction force multiplied by, the, by that reaction force should equal then the perpendicular lever arm for the weight multiplied by the, uh, that particular weight. All right, solving for F uh, sub R, just divide out R sub R, and we would get now, I'm just gonna do it right here, all on the same stage. Here we're gonna get RR, and this is now the formula. So all we gotta do is plug in these values to find the total reaction force, okay? So here we have F sub R will then be equal to the lever arm for the weight, which was 0.9, the weight, which was 50 times 9.8, and that's all divided then by the perpendicular lever arm for the reaction force of 1.5 meters. So F sub R, remember this is the total. Okay, should be 0 0.9 times 50 times 9.8, all divided by uh, 1.5. So we get a value of 294. Now remember that's the total, and therefore to find it for each hand, we'd have to now take this value and divide it by two, right? Divide it by two. And now when we do that, we get a value of about 147. In terms of sig figs, it looks like I should actually have two sig figs because of the 0.9 meters. But uh, you know, don't don't go don't go crazy with the sig figs here. All right, just um, I'm gonna write in 147. It should probably be more accurately 100 and. Uh, 150 quite honestly if we do talk if we do consider significant figures this should be the technically correct answer um, 
but you know, just just keep that in mind. All right. I I think I don't know what the answer is in the book, but um, they might have this. They might have this one. You know, if you notice, they're not too specific with sig figs at points. And it, uh, you know, as you as you move on in the class here, it's kind of like, eh, who cares about sig figs? So one of these is the right answer. <laughs> OK, um, uh, what are the units here? So these are Newtons, right? Because we're talking about forces. So we've got Newtons and Newtons. OK, I'll just box this answer. Now, that is the answer to letter A. All right, that's the force of each hand. Now, letter B, <clears throat> it says the triceps muscle at the back of the upper arm has an effective lever arm of 1.75 centimeters, and she exerts a force on the floor at a horizontal distance of 20 centimeters from the elbow joint. Calculate uh, the magnitude of the force in each tricep muscle and compare it to her uh, total weight. All right. So this one is a little, you know, I'm sure you read that over in a kind of glossed, you know, you get a little glazy eye view because it's like, what the heck are they talking about? It's a very, it's very hard to interpret what they're saying here in, in terms of a picture, but I'm going to do my best. So take a look at the arm up here. Here's the elbow joint. Here's the forearm. And here's the upper arm. Okay. The upper arm I just drew in right now. So forearm upper arm, elbow joint, okay? The triceps is a muscle group at the back of the arm, and essentially the tendon of such wraps around the elbow joint and inserts into the posterior part of the olecranon process, all right, which is basically a bony landmark on the uh, posterior aspect of the ulna on the superior side. So knowing that that's the case, if the tricep muscle wraps around here, Okay, and attaches right into the uh, ulna, right, right below the elbow joint. The triceps muscle here then actually provides a force that is in this direction on the ulna. Now, if you think about this, right, if this force is applied to this rigid bar, which is the forearm, aka, the, I mean, the forearm is the radius in the ulna, but you can just think about it as the ulna for right now. Um, it would rotate then this forearm counter, uh, excuse me, clockwise. And if we realize what will happen, right, if it rotates all the way to the top, the arm straightens. Okay, now it's not, also you have during the push-up, you also have some rotational dynamics occurring at the shoulder joint as well. Obviously, you know, the end position of a push-up doesn't have your arm looking like this. Okay, so there's really two things going on here, but we're just trying to simplify the problem. So we're just looking at what goes on at the elbow joint. Now, okay, so that's one thing, okay? So if I were to now, so that takes care of that part, all right? So they told us the effective lever arm, and now we got to figure out, well, what, what do they mean by this 20 centimeters at a horizontal distance from the elbow joint, blah, blah, blah. So just pretend you're doing a push-up, okay? And here I'll draw like, pretend we're taking an aerial view, all right? Now it's not the best aerial view, but here are the hands, okay? Those are the hands, and here's your body, basically. Right. All right. These this is your upper arm and this would be considered both forearms. OK, so the tricep muscle, remember, is the muscle that is on the back of the arm here on the posterior side, wraps around the elbow and starts into that the uh, posterior part of the olecranon process. All right. And uh, remember, that's going to apply a force basically in this direction and it's going to help straighten the arm or make the angle between, you know, the forearm and the upper arm, it helps it go from 90 degrees to 180 degrees, right? It helps increase that angle. Therefore, that being the case, all right, they also tell us then that this force that the hand is basically applying to the floor, because she's applying a force to the floor, all right, does not act at a, uh, it has a lever arm, okay? Uh, it's it, it it, they told us it's at a horizontal distance of 20 centimeters. Therefore, her hand and her lower arm is not in this orientation. For if it were, the force would be applied this way. Here's the axis of rotation. And notice how the line of action of that force is exactly over the axis of rotation. And therefore, it would have no uh, torque. That's not what they're asking us to do here when they tell us that the 20 centimeter uh, distance 
is the horizontal distance between the force and the elbow joint, okay? So instead of her arm looking like this, in reality, it probably looks like this. It's gonna be at an angle, okay? Here's her hand now. So, well, how did I know to go that way instead of this way? It actually doesn't matter, right? Either way you did it, um, it wouldn't, we're gonna come up with the same calculations. I'm gonna do it out this way. I think it makes it a little clearer. So now this is the whole idea, right? She's applying a force, okay, to the floor. This is the F sub R force that we just calculated over here. I'm talking about one arm and therefore I'm using the one arm force. In my calculations, I'm going to use the more exact value though, just so you're aware. So uh, this reaction force is a force pointing uh, straight into the floor. Okay, now if I were to, rem well, first remember the axis of rotation here is the elbow joint, so I'm gonna dot it, okay? So here's the axis of rotation. In terms of the lever arm that exists, the perpendicular lever arm for this force, dot the line of action of that force, and then what is the perpendicular distance, perpendicular relative to this line of action, between the line of action and the axis of rotation? It is this distance right here, boom. Okay, this is what they mean by the 20 centimeters from the elbow joint. Okay, so this value right here is 20 centimeters. Okay, now, and well, I was, I don't, I was going to say any questions about that, but I, I can't really hear you if you do. Um, so hopefully there are no questions. In any case, um, so we take, so that takes care of the reaction force. And now remember the the nature of this triceps muscle right, through the common tendon on the back, inserts into this part, the posterior part of the electronon process right there on the superior part of the ulna. Now, when this tricep muscle inserts here, remember, it pulls on that ulna in that direction, okay? So I do have now another force here pointing in this direction. And this is the force of the triceps, I'll call it, okay? And they told us the effective lever arm of that tricep is 1.75 centimeters. So guess what the distance is right in here between the axis of rotation and that force? It is exactly what they told us. That is the perpendicular distance because they said the effective lever arm. And therefore this distance right in here is equal to 1.75 centimeters. Now, simplifying the picture, take a look at what we got guys. We got a bar, axis of rotation here. We have a force pointing up. This is the reaction force, F sub R. It is located at a distance. Okay, if I were to dot that down, it is located at a distance, perpendicular distance of 20 centimeters. Okay, I also have this other force that's acting in this direction. Okay, that's the uh, force of the tricep muscle. And the distance, the perpendicular distance between the axis of rotation and the tricep muscle, as they told us right here, is gonna be 1.75 centimeters. So notice this picture is nice and, you know, it's a lot cleaner now. How many torques are there? Well, there are two, okay? Two torques, why? Because there are two forces acting at a distance to the axis of rotation. Now, this being the case, um, we also, so we, we know that there are two torques, right? Uh, are the sum of the torques zero in this problem? Well, yes. Why? Because they told us that it's constant speed. So therefore, net forces are zero. Um, we'll assume that there are no rotational accelerations either. Okay. So now what I'm going to do here is say sum of the torques all equal zero. Um, two torques, again, right? I have the uh, this uh, reaction force would rotate since I talked about this arm, it would rotate it counterclockwise, and therefore the torque produced by that reaction force is positive. Exactly opposite would be the case of the torque produced by the force of the tricep. It would rotate the arm clockwise, and therefore it's negative. Okay, tricep is equal to zero. Now I have a nice little equation here. I'm going to write it on the top. So we have the torque of the tricep is equal to the torque produced by the reaction force. Putting in the perpendicular lever arms, uh, we have the Perpendicular lever arm for the tricep multiplied by the force of the tricep is equal to the perpendicular lever arm for the reaction force multiplied by that reaction force. Solving for the force of the tricep because that's what they want. Calculate the magnitude and the force of each tricep muscle. We can now solve this. Actually, just divide out R sub T from both sides. 
I'm gonna do it right here so I can just save some space. I'm gonna erase it on this side now, and there is our formula. All right, now plug in the values. F sub T is gonna be equal to the perpendicular lever arm for the reaction force, 20 centimeters. I'm gonna convert it into meters. Why? Because I always do. Um, it's a great reason, right? Why? Because I said so. Uh, <laughs> and now we have the uh, reaction force that we just solved for over here. I'm going to plug in the more exact value, like I said before, the 147, divided by then uh, R sub T, and that's the perpendicular lever arm for the tricep, was 1.75 centimeters. Convert that into um, uh, convert that into meters, so 0 0.0175. And now just calculate it. I'm going to move this up slightly so I have a little more room there. And we're going to get a value. Force of the tricep muscle is now equal to 0.2 times 147 divided by 0 0.0175. Look at that. 1680. That's a tremendously large force. In terms of sig figs here, this should have this. There were three sig figs for this value here. I just didn't add those zeros, but you know, I, I'm just simplifying it, all right? So here, uh, again, yeah, we'll have three sig figs in this answer. So this is one, uh, 1,680 newtons. That's the force that the tricep muscle produces. Isn't that kind of crazy, right? That's kind of crazy that it takes, um, essentially, she's only inputting a force onto the floor, right, of 147 newtons. Uh, but the tricep muscle itself is contracting with 1,680 newtons worth of force. It's a considerable amount of uh, force difference. Why is that the case? Well, that's because the lever arm of the tricep is so small, okay? Um, and then it says, you know, compare it to her weight. So basically just take, you know, it's just a ratio now. Just take the, the force of the tricep muscle and then divide it by the uh, her weight, okay? So it would be 1680 over her weight, which was 50 times 9.8. This will tell us how many times larger that value is. And what do we get? We get about 3.4. So there's about 3.4 times her weight. Okay, 3.4, I just write a little X like times her weight, okay? So it's a lot, a lot of force. All right, uh, letter, letter C. <sighs> how much work does she do if her center of mass rises 0.24 meters? All right, so lovely, we get to... Go, go to work now. So remember the formula for work. Work is equal to force applied multiplied by the distance over which that force is applied then multiplied by the cosine of the angle between these two vectors. All right. Um, I know I said distance, not displacement. Distance is a scalar. I, I know. I'm just simplifying the terms. So um, uh, now what we need to do in order to find the work, right, we have to find the uh, force applied and the distance over which... Uh, it's covered. So since you got to understand in the nature of what we're talking about, they want to know how much work does she do if her center of mass, so they're talking about the work uh, required to raise the center of mass 0.24 meters. So what force is applied? So in order to find the work here, we have to know the force applied to raise her center of mass. So what force is being applied to raise the mass? Well, it's constant speed and therefore the force necessary to raise the center of mass is equal to the weight itself, right? Because there's no acceleration of her body going up. So therefore, whatever force is being inputted into raising the center of gravity has to be equal to the weight pulling down on that center of gravity because there is no acceleration. So I know that this force vector here should just be equal to her mass multiplied by gravity. The distance right over which um, her center of mass is moving, they told us, was the 0.24. So I'm just going to leave that as my D for now. And then the cosine of the angle between this force vector and the distance. Remember, the force is being applied upward to move her body uh, up. It's exactly counteracted by the weight. There's no acceleration. And uh, the distance is also in the same direction. So therefore, the angle here is 0. Cosine of 0 is just 1. So that whole thing just cancels. So we're down to this simple equation. So the work here will be equal to, uh, to then the mass, 50, multiplied by 9.8, multiplied by the distance of 0.24. I know there's another sig fig there, but I'm just getting tired of this problem at this point. <laughs> 50 times 9.8 times 0.24. So three sig figs, uh, 118, okay? 
118. Y three sig figs, remember, I know I'm just, you know, it's I put in 50 here, but the real number is 50.0, but I'm not, you know, if you wanna consider sig figs, go back and take a look at the numbers that we're using in the, uh, in the problem, actually. So this is in terms of joules, so that's the amount of work. All right, last but not least, guys. How long is this video, like 60 minutes? I don't know. Uh, okay, what is her useful power output? If she does 25 push-ups in one minute. All right, I'm going to do letter D up here. Okay, so letter D. Uh, what do we got? Okay, so what is her useful power output? That uh, power output, that's the important term, useful power. Okay, by, by useful power, what they're meaning here is they should be meaning the power, power output against gravity okay remember um i mean we have several formulas uh, we have several formulas for power right uh, the most useful one might be well, the, it, it really doesn't matter which one uh, we choose but we can say that the power is equal to the work done over the time okay now how much uh, work or over what time period are we talking about? Well, we're talking about one minute. Okay. So remember in terms of the power, we're always talking about in terms of seconds. Okay. This is work or joules per second. And therefore that's called a watt. Okay. So I need to have seconds down here. So I already know that in terms of my power equation, I should have 60 on the bottom. Why? Because they told me these values in terms of one minute. Okay, I need to convert my minute into second. So one minute, 60 seconds, easy enough. Then what's the total work? Now remember I said it's the power output against gravity. So every time she moves her body upward, she's moving against gravity, correct? And therefore, we're gonna consider the useful output, um, useful power output as only when she ri uh, raises her body upward, okay? Now if she does 25 push-ups, that means she goes up and down, right, up, up and down 25 times. But she only moves against gravity instead of 50 times, right, which would be the total up and down. She only moves against gravity 25 times, which is exactly equal to the amount of push-ups she does. So that being the case, right, the useful power output will then be the power, excuse me, the work done per push-up, right, moving against gravity, which was this value down here, the 118, Multiplied then by the number of push-ups she does in that one minute, so that's 25. Just calculate it now. So 118 times 25 divided by 60, and we get a value of about 49. Okay, so 49 watts is her useful power output. Guys, thank you very much for tuning in. I hope this video helped. Very complicated, but you know if you sit through this and understand it, you'll be served very well in the future. All right. So again, thanks for joining. Please remember to subscribe. It definitely helps us out. We're trying to do our best here. We'd appreciate very much if you can um, subscribe. Remember, it only takes a quick second. Um, so that would be awesome. Um, if it helped too, please hit that like button. And uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, in the end of this, but uh, I'll see you in the next video. Take care.